السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام على سید المرسلین و خاتم النبیین محمد و علیہ و صحبہ اجمعین و من تبعہم بحسان و دعا بدعوتہم الى یوم الدین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قال الله تعالى في الفرقان الحميد إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات كانت لهم جنات الفردوس نزلا صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم تسليما My noble brothers, sisters and elders The formula to complete success is divided into two sections and both sections have been spoken about in the Quran many a times and both sections have been spoken about many a times by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam the first part or the first ingredient to the formula of success is to attain faith known as Iman. One day one Sahabi said to the Prophet of Allah, Mal Iman, what is Iman? And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a few words explained Iman. He, th- he said, إِذَا سَرَّتْكَ حَسَنَّتُكَ وَسَاءَتْكَ سَيِّئَتُكَ فَأَنْتَ مُؤْمِنِ That when good pleases you, when you commit to good and after committing to good you feel rejoice and happiness and whenever you commit wrong it leaves you upset this is a sign of iman so prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this statement he says that whenever you commit to good and you feel happy after committing to good and whenever a mistake is made and you feel upset, this is Iman. Then one Sahabi said, Ayyul Iman Afzal. Which Iman is Afzal? Because there are different levels of Iman. Which Iman is Afzal? And Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, Al-Hijrah. Hijrah basically means migration. So the Sahaba said, فَمَا hijra? What do you mean by hijra? And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, تَهْجُرُ su." To move away, to migrate from the valleys of darkness, evil and vice, and make it into the valleys of righteousness and piety. This is the highest level of Iman, or the superior level of Iman. Now, Iman is something that is concealed. You can't see it. It is not tangible. It is not vis- visible. It does not have a visible or a physical shape. So how do we know what is the condition of the Iman that is concealed in the heart? For that, we come to the second ingredient to the formula of success, and that is good deeds. That's why Allah says in the glorious Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Those people that have faith and then they commit to good deeds for them is Jannah. So good deeds in reality is a translation of the Iman that is inside. And bad deeds is a translation that the Iman inside has become weak. That's why Imam Ghazali, rahimahumullah, he divides the human body into two sections. He says one is the village of ilm and one is the village of amal. The head is the village of ilm. And this section below the head is the village of amal, practice. So we acquire knowledge through the eyes, through the nose, through the mouth, through the ears, through our brain. 
and it is all processed in the heart. It is all processed in the heart. And whatever knowledge we acquire through these doors of knowledge, the body, the village of Amal, will start to practice upon it. So if we feed Haya, modesty through the eyes, this body will create actions that demonstrate modesty. If we listen to truth, we will produce a'mal that are righteous and truthful. So this is the village of amal. And I say that we call this the factory of producing deeds. We should look at our body and say that Allah has given me this factory. And with this factory, I am going to create deeds. Deeds that are pleasing to my creator. Because there is a very, very strong connection between deeds and our well-being. And that is our topic for today. Deeds have a very, very strong connection with our well-being. If there was a snake in this masjid, one snake, most probably the entire majma will disperse and run in opposite directions. Reason being is that everyone is aware of the venom that the snake carries. And if I become close to the snake, he may inject the venom and I may die. So a person is aware of the harm that can be caused by the snake. He's well aware, so he won't go close to it. And you don't have to educate anyone, everyone knows. If there was a lion in this masjid, even if the lion was sleeping in the corner, we will not come into the masjid. Because we know that if the lion wakes up, there is a possibility he will attack and I will lose my life. No one deliberately will jump into fire because he knows the harm of fire. Likewise, we have to realize that good deeds have an impact and bad deeds have an impact as well. Good deeds and bad deeds have an impact. The only thing is we cannot feel it and sense it and see it immediately. But there's a saying in English, it will come back to haunt you. Every sin a person commits, it does come back to haunt you. Sufyan Thawri, rahimahumullah, used to say that if I did anything wrong at night, early in the morning, I felt that my conveyance, my animal, is not obedient to me. My wife is not obedient to me. My children are not obedient to me. How can they be obedient to me when I was not obedient to Allah? How could they be obedient to me when I was not obedient to Allah one night before? So when a person looks at deeds with this nazriya, with this ideology, with this concept, it becomes very easy for him to commit his body, his energy, his time to good deeds and at the same time to abstain from bad deeds. When I know that if I commit haram, I am touching fire. Allah says in the last verse of the first section of Surah Nisa, Those people that take advantage of the wealth of the yatim, the orphans, they should know that they are filling their stomach with fire. He doesn't feel it right now because Allah does not want him to feel it right now because if he feels it right now then his iman is not upon ghaib on the unseen it is iman on something that is visible everyone will accept when they will see akhirah even Fir'aun when he was dying Ramses when he was dying he said Amantu billah, I believe in Allah but because the veils were removed and he could see the other side, his iman was not accepted. There's a beautiful story on this. Harun Rashid and his wife, Zubaydah, they used to walk in their orchard. 
So one day, Harun Rashid, he left his wife behind and he was running down the track. En route, he found that Bahlol, who was a saintly person, he was sitting and he was making homes out of sand, like sand castles. So Harun Rashid said to him, Oh Bahlol, what are you doing? Bahlol, what are you doing? He said, I am making this castle. If you buy it from me, I will make dua that Allah give you Jannah. Harun Rashid said, how much will you sell it for? He said, one dirham. Harun Rashid looked at the castle made out of sand, looked at Bahlol, thought about the one dirham and said that you are a pagala, you are a madman. And he just walked ahead. Didn't give him any importance. He passed by and then Zubaydah, the wife, came. Zubaydah said to Bahlol, what are you doing? He said, I'm making this house out of castle. Uh, out of sand, would you like to buy it? She said, if I do buy it, what do I get out of it? He said, I will make dua that Allah give you Jannah. I make dua that Allah give you Jannah. How much is it? One dirham. She gave him importance. She gave the dirham to him and walked away. That same night, Harun Rashid saw a dream. And he found himself in this beautiful orchard, beautiful garden. And in that garden was a beautiful home, a house. And on the front door, it was inscribed Zubaida. So Harun Rashid said to the guard that this is the house of my wife. I would like to enter it. And the guard said that in this world, you cannot enter. Only the person can enter whose name is on the door. And that is your wife. So she has to open it. So early in the morning when he woke up, he ran to Bahlol. He found Bahlol sitting there making houses out of sand. So Harun Rashid said to him, what are you doing? He said, I'm making houses out of sand. And Bahlol said, would you like to buy it? He said, yes. He said, if I do buy it, what do I get? He said, I'll make dua for you that Allah give you Jannah. He said, what is the price? He said, your entire kingdom. He said, one day ago, it was one dirham, and now it is the entire kingdom. Why? He said, yesterday it was ghaib, and today everything has been seen by you. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كُفَّارٌ فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمْ مِلْءُ الْأَرْضِ ذَهَبًا وَلَوْ افْتَدَى بِهِ When a person on the other side, a non-believer, when he dies, and his eyes of his heart open to reality, he will give everything that this world contains to ransom himself from the chastisement. It will not be accepted. It will not be accepted. So coming back to the topic Iman, this faith is accepted when we do not see anything. We do not feel the burning sensation in the stomach. When we take advantage of the wealth of a yateen. But once we make it on the other side, a person will feel it. He will feel the burning sensation in his stomach, as made mention in the glorious Quran. Now when a person connects deeds with positive impact, negative impact, he will take a back step. He will think. And this is what we have to do. This is what we have to do. In Australia, we have different fuels. Unleaded fuel. I don't know if you have it in Doha. Then we have super fuel. Then Formula One cars, they have the best fuel. And one day I was thinking, I said, look at these different fuels. The different fuels facilitate different model cars. So if it is an old car, unleaded is good enough because it's not very fast. And if it is a brand new car, a late model car, then you have to give it 
premium or super fuel to facilitate the make of that car because it will drive much faster. And if you go into the Formula One car that goes 300 Ks per hour, you need the best fuel. Now they are driving on a flat surface. When we make it to the other side, we're going to be traveling upwards. Because Jannat is divided into a hundred sections. So we have to take fuel from here. And fuel is good deeds. Now if we take good deeds that are unleaded, our vehicle, our conveyance will stop maybe at the first level. If we take premium, we may get to the 40th level. And if we take the best fuel, we'll make it to Jannatul Firdaus. And that is our goal. That's why the Prophet of Allah used to say, فَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهِ فَاسْأَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ Whenever you ask for Jannah, ask for Jannatul Firdaus. But for Jannatul Firdaus, and the roof of Jannatul Firdaus is the Arsh of Allah, we have to travel upwards. We need the best fuel. Not only a good deed, but a good deed that is beautified with the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah, with sincerity, with ikhlas, so on and so forth. Then a person, he will attain success. There's a cruiser, cruising in the ocean. So each person has paid $10,000 to be on that cruise. And there are 100 people on that cruise. Suddenly the captain, he shouts out that I believe that we have found a new island. I believe that we have found a new island. Because on the map and in the navigation system, I do not see an island. So we are the first ones that have found this island. The closer they drift to the island, the wider their eyes open. Because they have never seen colors like that before. They have never seen trees like that before. They have never seen fountains like that before. They are mesmerized. And like we say, they are bamboozled, knocked out. So the captain says, according to all the gadgets that we have, there is a mighty, mighty tsunami that is going to hit this island in three hours. So we've got two and a half hours to explore this island. And we may be the first people that will step on this island. To be on the safe side, what we will do is we will dock at this island and we will divide the hundred people into two groups. Fifty, one group. Fifty, the second group. Fifty in one group will explore the right side of the island. And fifty people that are on the left side, they will explore the left side of the island. But keep in mind, you have to be back in two and a half hours because according to my gadget, there is a massive tsunami that is going to hit this island in three hours. And we can't be there at that time. Allahu Akbar. So the group on the right, they enter. Allahu Akbar. They enter. They come across a tree. And they see this rosy, fresh fruit that they have never seen before hanging from this tree. Now the announcement has been made in two and a half hours you have to be back. So the Amir of that Jama'ah, he says, look, this is a beautiful fruit. Why don't we enjoy it? They said, why not? So they pluck the fruit. And each person plucks a fruit and takes a bite. They are enjoying the taste of the fruit. But at the same time, the announcement is ringing in their mind. They are enjoying, but they're looking at the time. Enjoying, but looking at the time. They don't forget the announcement. After consuming the whole fruit, they look at the time, they watch, they say, we've got another one and a half hours, let's go further into the island to explore. They go further into the island and they see this beautiful lake, fresh lake. And they see a small waterfall. And it is surrounded by bush, very natural, clear crystal water. So they said, why don't we have a swim in this and enjoy a swim. They said, why not? They all jump into that fresh lake. 
with each stroke, the announcement of the captain is ringing in their mind. They are enjoying, they're splashing water on each other, but they're looking at their watch at the same time. And they can because you have waterproof watches nowadays. So they're watching, they're looking, and they're enjoying. They are laughing, they are giggling, but they're looking at the time. They come out, and at a distance, they see something marvelous. But they look at their watch and they say, look, we have to retreat. We have to walk backwards now. We can't go any further because if we do, we won't be back in two and a half hours. So they make a U-turn. They want to go further. They want to see what is in front of them. But they take a U-turn and they return back and they stand at the station. Now what happens to the group on the left? They go into the island. Same announcement was made. Announcement was made. Same announcement. They enter the island. They come across the first tree. A beautiful fruit is hanging. The Amir says, let's enjoy. They pluck the fruit. They put it into their mouth. Each bite propels these people to forget the announcement. The announcement starts to fade away from the mind. The ecstasy, the enjoyment, the flavor of that fruit is so strong that they start to forget the announcement. So they keep exploring and they go deeper and deeper into the ocean, uh, into that island. And a time comes that they are unaware of time. Given this similitude, this example, this is the example of humanity. That island is this dunya. And the different things that are attractive are objects, commodities, the glitter and the glow of this world. The announcement has been made by the Creator. Minha khalaqnaakum, wa fiha nu'idukum, wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. Minha khalaqnaakum, we have created you. Wa fiha nu'idukum, and you will return to us. Wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra, we will bring you back to life again from the grave. That's why when a person passes away, each person he will get three heads full of soil and he will say, Minha khalaqnaakum, wa fiha nu'idukum, wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. The announcement was made. Now those people that enjoy this dunya, they may be living in the best homes, but the announcement of Allah is ringing in their mind. Islam does not say enjoy. Islam says enjoy. But whilst you are enjoying, don't forget that there is a life beyond this life, that is the ultimate life, that is the true life, those people will succeed. They will eat the best foods, they will drive the best cars, they will sleep on the best beds, they will enjoy the company of the best people, but they will remember minha khalaqnaakum. So every act of their life will be in conformity with the orders of Allah, they will succeed. But there will be a group of people that will forget that announcement. So when the tsunami comes, and tsunami is death, they will not be prepared. They will be left on that island. Allahu Akbar. This is life. We have to gather good deeds. You know, a person has a credit card. When you travel, you have a credit card. Having a credit card is good, but an empty credit card, no good. So first of all, you apply for a credit card. If the application is accepted, you are granted a credit card. Now that credit card is similar to Iman. Having Iman, you put an application, your Iman is accepted, you have been given a credit card. But an empty credit card won't get you too far. You have to fill it up with fulus, with money. The more money you have in the credit card, the more you can use it. Now you need to fill your credit card of good deeds with good deeds. That's why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, and I would like you to listen to this hadith attentively. Hadith is in Tirmazi reported by Ahzad Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very, very wise. Very, very wise. Very, very intelligent. Sahaba were very intelligent, very, very wise people. 
I'll just give you one story of the wisdom of one student of Muhammad so you can understand. And I am alluding to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala. Prophet Muhammad used to say, Ana Madinatul Ilam, wa Aliyun Babuha. Prophet Muhammad said, I am the city of knowledge, and Hazrat Ali is the door of that city. Very, very intelligent, one student. There were two people. They sat down on the sufra to share a meal. One person opened his bag and he had five khubs, five rotis, five breads. The other one opened his bag and he had three khubs, in total eight. Eight khubs. Suddenly one musafir was passing by, one traveler, and he said, I would like to share a meal with you. I would like to be a part of this meal. Both were very hospitable. They said, Ahlan wa sahl, sit down. Three people ate eight breads. Now this person did not place any bread. The traveler did not place a bread on the sufra. He just came to eat. Now when he was ready to leave, he thought that I have had this meal without paying. So what he did is he put eight dirhams on the sufra and walked away now the person that put five khubs on the sufra he said out of the eight dirham i should get five you put three you should get three dirham the person that put three khubs on the sufra he said no half half nis nis four four now they started to dispute over the eight dirham when they could not come to a conclusion, they said, let's go to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala. So they went to Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala. Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala addressed the person that put three khubs on the sufra and he said, look, accept five and three. Accept five and three, as he is saying. He said, no, I want adl, I want justice. He said, you cannot bear justice. He said, no, I want justice. He said, justice is... Out of eight dirham, seven will go to the person that put five khubas and you will only get one dirham. What kind of adal is this? He said, this is the adal. Now, Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and did not study mathematics. But he was the door to the city of knowledge. And all this stemmed from the khazana of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now the person inquired, he said, how did you come up with this number? So Sadali Ali radiallahu ta'ala said, look, how many people ate eight breads? He said, three. So I said, each bread divided into three sections, three pieces. So each bread divided into three pieces. How many breads? Eight. Eight multiplied by three is how many? Twenty-four. So I said, all right, so each person ate how many pieces? Eight. So you placed three breads. How many pieces is that? You placed three breads. So how many pieces did you place? Nine. And each person ate how many? Eight. So you only placed one piece on the sufra for the traveler. The person that put five rotis there, the five khubs, how many pieces? 15. How many did he eat? 8. How many did he leave for the traveler? 7. So he gets 7 dirham. Allahu Akbar. How intelligent. That's why in the battle of Badr, before the starting of the battle of Badr, the Prophet of Allah heard commotion. So Prophet Muhammad said, what is happening? They said, we caught a spy. And we're trying to find out how many people are in the army of the mushrikun. But he's not spitting it out. So Prophet Muhammad said, leave him, bring him to me. So that spy was brought to the Prophet of Allah. Sallallahu so Prophet Muhammad said, how many people do you have in your army? He said, I don't know. So Muhammad Sallallahu changed the topic. He said, what is your name? From which clan are you? What do your forefathers do? When he became comfortable, Prophet Muhammad said to him, How many camels do you slaughter every day? 
He said, ten. Prophet Muhammad said, there's a thousand people in the army because one camel is sufficient for a hundred people. Understood? And there were a thousand people in the army of the mushrikun in the battle of Badr. So intelligent. Now that wise person, Muhammad sallallahu says, Badiru bil a'mali sab'an. Hal tantaziruna illa faqram munsiya? Aw ghinam mutghiya? Aw maradam mufsida? Aw haramam mufnida? Aw mawtan mujhiza? Aw iddajjal fa sharru ghaibin yuntadar? Aw issa'a fa issa'atu adha wa amar? Aw kama kala alayhi salatu wa salam. Be hasten, be quick in committing to good deeds before you are overtaken by seven things. Seven things. Keep in mind who is saying this? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are you waiting for poverty that will make you unmindful of devotion? In Indonesia, because it's close to Australia, we go to Indonesia to give da'wah. And in a island, we came to know missionaries are working upon the Muslims that are poor, that have been struck by destitution and poverty and faqr. And in a few islands, 400,000 Indonesian brothers have denounced Islam. 400,000, and this is 10 years ago. One of our brothers, he was going with a few brothers to give da'wah in Indonesia. There were four or five brothers for 40 days. And on that plane, there was a priest with his family, with his wife and his children. So they started to talk to each other. And that priest said to the Muslim brother, where are you going? He said, we're going to visit our Muslim brothers. He said, how long are you going for? He said, for 40 days. Muslim asked him, who are you? He said, I'm a priest. He said, where do you think you're going? He said, we're going to work, work upon your Muslims to show them the truth of Christianity. He said, how long are you going for? He said, five years. Five years. Allah. He went for five years, this person with his family. And what they were doing in that town was amazing. People were struck by destitution. So the people enter the town, the missionaries, and one fine night, they will put a parcel of food on the door of these poor people. Early in the morning, they will wake up and they will find food. That same day, the priest will come and they will say that Jesus came last night. Did you receive anything? He said, yes, we received a parcel. He said, Jesus, come to save you. Are you waiting for poverty that will make you unmindful of devotion? Alhamdulillah, we are prosperous. We have food on the table. Are we waiting that the tables turn? Because when a person is struck by destitution, the trials and the tribulations to follow are very, very severe. Or are you waiting for prosperity that will make you rebellious? And this is our condition. We are trying to achieve a better standard, a higher standard known as ghina. Are you trying to attain prosperity that will make you rebellious? Now we come to the masjid. Now we are devoted. There is a possibility that if Allah gives us prosperity, we will become mutakabbir. Fir'aun, he was mutakabbir. What did he say? Ana rabbukum al-a'la. Because he had wealth. How many people, when they are struck by problems, they make a lot of dua. But once problems are removed, and Allah gives them wealth, they forget their origin, and they forget Allah. Oh, mutghiya. Are you waiting for prosperity that will make you rebellious? Oh, maradam mufsida. Or sickness that disables you. We are very, very healthy. One day, um, and this was an eye-opener for myself in Australia. 
This was in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002. I washed the bodies there. Normally we wash the bodies there, the Imams wash the bodies. So for the last uh, three, four years, I have been relieved from that because the community has grown. But from 96 to 2005, most of the brothers that used to pass away in Brisbane, I used to wash their bodies. One day we received a call from a hospital. Allah said that uh, there is a person brain dead. He's brain dead and he's in the hospital with his family. We would like you to come and counsel the family. I said that, who is the family? They said the family are tourists. They have come from Holland. They have come from Holland. I said, do they speak English? They said, yes, they speak English. I said, what happened? Over the phone. They said, what happened is that uh, in Australia we drive right hand. In his country, they used to drive left hand, as Doha is different than Australia. So he was with his girlfriend, this person was with his girlfriend, Muslim guy, with his girlfriend in Cairns. And he was on the wrong side of the road. Buses, well, a bus was passing by. Now you see the, the mirror of a bus, it's pretty wide, pretty big. It hit him on the head at 100 k's per hour and he dropped and he was brain dead but what really shocked me is I said who is this person he said that he was the most talented soccer player in Holland and he was to be signed up with the national team he was a Moroccan guy He's going to be signed up with the national team, but he said, I want to visit the world. I want to see the world before I sign up. So he was traveling the world with his girlfriend. He had dunya in his hand, on the plate. He was to return and become an international player. Allah had other plans. When I watched this person, he had a six-pack. Mighty muscles. A perfect body. But the head had swollen to a size of a watermelon. And they had to pull the plug and he had passed away. That's why Allah's Habib says, Oh, Marada Mufsida, are you waiting for a sickness that will disable you? Now I am Shabab, I am young. Play Qurratul Qadam, enjoy soccer. But use this body in the obedience of Allah as well. If we can play soccer for one and a half hours, why can't we use this body to commit to ibadat for one and a half hours? Why can't I stand in front of my Allah throughout the night for one hour? If I'm taking care of the body, what about the soul? Why don't I gather good deeds? So the health that we enjoy now, it will not be there always. It will deteriorate. So don't wait for the tables to turn because it may turn in such a way that is not favorable. Oh, Haram and Mufnida, are you waiting for old age? That will make you lose your senses. A lot of people say, Abito Mad Jawan, I am young, let me enjoy life. This young age passes very quickly. See the grey hair, and then suddenly eh, the teeth are a bit loose, then the nazara, then you got the specks, you know, then you don't feel so healthy, you play a game and then you, recovery time is one week. Before you used to play a game, you don't have to recover, you are fit and fresh and healthy. Now you play a game and recovery time is one week, pain throughout the entire body. Aren't these signs? Oh, harama mufnida. And then a time comes, you give up the game. You say it's not worth it. Oh, harama mufnida. Old age will make you lose your senses. Oh, mauta mujhiza. Are you waiting for sudden death that will not allow you to prepare for tawbah? Just like that boy who passed away. Oh, mauta mujhiza. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. He hired the service of one boy. If you read the Sawani Umri, 
the biography of Hazrat Umar, you will come to know he hired the service of one boy. He said that whenever I am engaged with people, because Islam was spreading like rapid fire in the time of Hazrat Umar, he said, whenever I engage with people, I want you to say moat. Maybe every five, ten minutes, moat. Just say moat. That is your duty. So I will remember moat. One day he said to the boy, Utla, chutti, go. I don't need you anymore. He said, look, don't you need to be reminded about moat? He said, I need to be reminded, but I've got a permanent reminder now. I don't need you. He said, what? He said, the gray hair. This is a permanent reminder. That's why Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and said to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qad shibta. And Nabi, aap to bure ho You have aged, O Prophet of Allah. You have aged. Why did he say this? Because a few gray hair in the bed of the Prophet of Allah. Qad shibta. You know what the Prophet of Allah said? Shayyibatni. Hud wal waqia wal mursalat wa amma yatasa'alun. Surahs like Surah Hud. Surah Waqia. Amma yatasa'alun. Ida shamsu kubirat. The surahs that speak about the destruction of previous nations. Surahs that speak about life after death. When I read them. It has such an impact upon my heart that I have grown old. Oh, Mawta Mujhiza, are you waiting for death? Are with the Jal or are you waiting for the Jal? Out of all the evil that are absent, this is the most evil that the Jal. Are you waiting for the final hour? The final hour is very bitter, very grievous. Are you waiting for that? So Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes mention of seven things. And if you study these seven things, you will find yourself in one of them. So wherever you are, in whichever theater Allah has placed you from that theater, try to collect good deeds. And the best fuel, because you are to travel upwards. You are to travel upwards. Now, If we study the Qur'an, we will come to know that there are many good deeds that have been connected with bounties. I'll give you an example. Just like I said, if you see a lion or if you see a snake or a creature that can attack you and tear you apart, you will stay away from it. Now, if we study the Qur'an from cover to cover, we will come to know there are many good deeds. With these good deeds, there is a bounty attached. Let's take the example of prayer. Allah says, Qad aflahal mu'minun. Now every single person sitting here, we are trying to attain success at some level. If I work, you work, we wake up in the morning, we sleep at the night, we exhaust ourselves throughout the day. Why? To attain success. But Allah says in the Quran, your success is attached with prayer. And the word used is not success, it is falah. And what does falah mean? Asi kamyabi jiske baad nakamini. Asi izzat jiske baad zillatni. Success that is not followed by failure. Success means dignity and honor that is not replaced with dishonor. So if we want success, we have to attain salah. We have to establish salah and then we have to establish salah like the prophet of allah established it sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli number one number two nowadays in the entire world people are struggling for inner peace you speak to many non-believers and you say why do you drink alcohol they work from monday to friday Friday and Saturday, they waste their entire wage in alcohol. Girls will adorn themselves with three or four hundred dollars for a Friday night and a Saturday night. And you will find these people lying in the gutter Friday, Saturday morning and Sunday morning. And you say to them, what is this life? And they say, oh, it's terrible, we won't do it. And you find them drinking the same night again. You ask them why? They said, for inner peace. We don't have peace. And what does the Quran say? Peace is not with objects. 
with the dhikr of Allah is peace. Remembering Allah. Yaad karna, yaad rakhna. Allah ko yaad karna, Allah ko yaad rakhna. Allah ko to maanta hai, lekin Allah ki ek ni maanta. Allah ko ek to maanta hai, ek hi ni maanta Allah. What is the meaning of this? That remembering Allah temporarily, that is dhikr. But the objective of dhikr is to remember Allah all the time. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish prayer so you remember Allah. Not only in the prayer. Because in the prayer, we remember Allah. But we want to take this feeling outside the prayer. So in every theater of life, we remember Allah. May it be our weddings. May it be our janazas. May it be our trade. May it be our commerce. We remember Allah. A beautiful uh, saying that there was a person sitting in the mosque, and I've, I've shared this with you, it's very appropriate. And uh, a person came into the mosque and looked at him and he said, I don't recognize you. Are you a musafir? Are you a traveler? He said, no, I reside in the mosque. He said, you're so beautiful. There's noor coming out of your face, but we have never seen you. He said, look, uh, I'm beautiful and everything, but no one accepts me outside the mosque. No one calls me to their functions, to their weddings, to their janazas, to their businesses. No one invites me. I am only left for the masjid. He said, what's your name? He said, my name is Islam. Now, Islam is left in the masjid. Allahu Akbar. That's when you're a Muslim. We remember Allah in salah, in the mosque. MashaAllah, we are very muttaqi. But, وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ The establishment of salah is for the remembrance of Allah in every theater of life. We say, Allahu Akbar. Now, eating is haram. Drinking is haram. Socialization is haram. And namaz should be such. You know, when we finish the namaz, we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Why do you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah? I'm sitting, I'm talking to you. Will I just say assalamu alaikum to you now? No. But when I entered, I said assalamu alaikum. Because I have just come freshly into the gathering, I say assalamu. When you say assalamu alaikum, it means that I was not here. Now I'm returning back from Mi'raj. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The establishment of prayer is for the remembrance of Allah in every theater of life. So remembering Allah will give you sakoon. Now, one person who is depressed, that's why I say Muslims can't be depressed. Depression is not part of Islam. How can a Muslim be depressed? We believe in predestination taqdeer, that everything befalls us by the will of Allah. How can we be depressed? And when we have dhikr, remembering Allah, how can we be depressed? Then Allah Rabbul Izzah says in the glorious Quran, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَىٰ This verse is amazing. It's a verse in Surah A'raf, verse 96. وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ If you, people of a town, آمَنُوا Believe in Allah, وَاتَّقُوا And you beautify your iman with good deeds, with taqwa, with righteousness, with piety. لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَىٰ Allah will open upon you the barakat of the heavens. When Allah speaks about the kuffar, Allah doesn't use the word barakat. Allah used the word abwaab as-sama. Ajeeb. When Allah speaks about the non-believers, Allah says that for the non-believers, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ فَلَمَّا نَسُوا When they forget me, when they forget my remembrance, I open upon them the doors of everything. Meaning that they receive commodities, but the benefit of that commodity will not remain with them. They will have a body, but they will not have health. They will have wealth, but they will have not sukoon, no sukoon. 
They will have commodities and objects in their hand, but deprived of the benefit. They will have a bed, but they can't fall asleep. But for a believer, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ Allah will allow the barakat to descend. And barakat, Allahu Akbar, is greater than the object. Greater than the object. It has been said that uh, there was one person, he saw a dream. Very poor. He saw a dream. And in the dream, the person said to him, you will find this story in Tafsir and Mazhari, in Jalalain, that this child, he was very obedient to his parents, very, very obedient to his parents, so, but he was very poor. So he saw a dream, and in the dream there was a person, he said, look, there's a tree. If you dig around that tree, you will find 100 dirham. So the child in the dream said, is there barakat in that 100 dirham? He said, no barakat. So he woke up in the morning, he told his wife that, look, I saw a dream and I believe it's true. And in the dream it said that there was 100 dirham there. I asked him, is there barakat? He said, no barakat, I don't want it. The wife said, we're dying, we've got no food on the table. He said, don't worry about it. Next day he saw a dream, the person came in the dream, he said, there's 50 dirham. He said, is there any barakat? He said, no barakat. He told his wife, the wife said, look, every day it's coming down. You're going to be left with anything. Just go and get the 50. He said, I don't want it. No barakat. Third day, he saw a dream. person came. He said that if you dig, you'll find one dirham. He said, is there barakat? He said, there's barakat. So in the morning, he told his wife. The wife said, you go and get the barakat. So he goes and he digs and he finds one dirham. Now with that one dirham, he says, what am I going to do with one dirham? So he said, for many days, we haven't had a hot meal. So I will buy the samak, the, the fish. So he goes to the supermarket, buys a fish, brings it home. When they cut it, inside there's a diamond. Barakatim min as This is called barakat. For the non-believers, doors open. Without barakat. For a believer, not doors. Everything opens, but with barakat. Allahu Akbar. So, if we want success, we establish prayer in our life. If we want sukoon, we establish dhikr in our life and if we want barakah to descend we adorn ourselves with taqwa and what is taqwa Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala said to Ubay bin Ka'b radiallahu ta'ala what is taqwa Ubay bin Ka'b said that taqwa is like a person enters a room or a garden in those days they used to be very baggy clothes they used to wear baggy clothes in those days they used to wear baggy clothes that's why has the buhrera radiallahu ta'ala and cats in his sleeve so to have a cat in your sleeve you can't have this sleeve it must be a very baggy sleeve so he sits in the majlis of the prophet and you find a cat dropping from his sleeve so they used to wear baggy clothes so ubay bin kaab said there's a track on the right and on the left of that track there is bush and there are thorns. So what will the person do? Naturally, he will gather his clothes in such a way that it does not get entangled with the thorns. And when he's walking, he will walk mindful of his right and his left. Because if he falls to one side, his cloth will be entangled with the thorn and it will rip his cloth. And he will walk with focus with attention and he will walk through the garden he will walk through the garden Ubay bin Kaab said that that garden is this dunya and that cloth baggy cloth is our iman and the bush and the thorns are all evil they attract us so if we gather ourselves and we walk carefully we will walk out of this dunya with a perfect iman one boy, he said to his sheikh, Oh, sheikh, I can't control my eyes. Just can't control my eyes. When I walk from my house to your madrasa, I can't control my eyes. I have to look right and left. The sheikh didn't utter a word. He didn't say anything to him. After a couple of days, he gave him a cup of hot milk. He said, look, take this hot milk 
and drop it at my wife's house. And if you drop one drop of milk from this cup, you will be suspended from the madrasa. And then when you return, my wife will give you something and don't allow that to drop as well and bring it back. He went, he came back, he went, delivered the glass or cup of milk, came back with a bowl of curry. Now the sheikh said to him, did you look to your right and your left? Did you see anyone? He said, I couldn't. My whole focus was the cup. My whole focus was the cup. When I was going, it was the focus that I don't want any milk to drop. And when I was coming back, I didn't want the curry to drop. That's why if you can focus properly, you will save yourself from evil and safeguard your iman. Now, further to this, <clears throat> one is practicing good. I'm giving you a few points. One is practicing good. But one is practicing it in the right way. For example, the Quran says, Qad If you pray, you will attain success. But at the same time, Allah says, Fawailun lil Woe upon those people that pray. So if a person is praying, but he's not praying properly, he is attracting the wrath of Allah. That's why it has been said, one person a Qari, mashallah, the Qari Sahib of the Masjid, beautiful Qirat. So, Qari Sahib and people like him that dedicate their life to the Quran on the Day of Judgment, Allah will say to them, Iqra, Wartaki, Waratil Kama Kunta Turatilu fi Dunya. Read like you used to read in the Dunya and pass through the different stages. But on the other hand, there are some people, Rubba Qari'in. There are many people that are Qaris, when they read the Qur'an, the Qur'an curses them. For example, he reads a verse of the Qur'an, The la'nat upon those that are liars. Now the person reading is a liar. He's cursing himself. So we have to be very, very mindful when we are praying that this prayer does not come back to haunt us. Because many people, they pray, their mind is not in the prayer. They do not commit their soul to the prayer. And then this prayer is wrapped up in a dirty cloth and thrown back at them. Allah does not want such a prayer. He's reading the Quran and he's going through certain passages of the Quran and he's not realizing that he's cursing himself. Because he is a culprit of that crime. So it is very, very important that we remember that. Now, if a person does attain good deeds, there are two rewards. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَلَنُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Two rewards for good deeds, for good iman. Number one, Allah will grant you a beautiful life. Hayatun tayyibah. Now, hayatun tayyibah is a term that is inclusive to barakat, inclusive to enjoyment, pleasure, everything. And the second reward is, وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ That on the other side, Allah will grant you the reward of your good deeds. And if a person commits to evil, then there are two punishments. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ظَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى That Allah will make his life miserable in this world. Despite having everything, his life will be miserable. And number two, on the day of judgment, he will stand blind. Allahu Akbar. If you, if you study the ahadith that depict the horror of the day of judgment think about it people standing in the state of nudity every person from the time of adam والسلام, till the last person then every jinn then angels now we can't see jinns there are jinns in this masjid but we can't see the muslim jinns you will see the jinns you will see the malaika you will see the hellfire you will see jannat as well 
on that day a person stands and he's blind that increases the anxiety if I am in this masjid you are in this masjid for many many years but if you turn off the lights and it is dark you will be scared you may trip over an object that is in the masjid despite being in this masjid for many many years just take the light away and you are in a territory that you're not familiar with even in your own house think about the day of judgment you've never been to the day of judgment you've never been to that ground before you've never been among such a mess of people human beings jinnat and angels and allah takes your eyes away you are blind to my ahkamat, to my orders. Now I will take your eyes away. You will be blind on the day of judgment. So it is very, very important, my noble brothers, that we collect good deeds. The topic is very vast. I had so much prepared, but I'm running out of time. So I'm trying to gather and finish my talk. There's one hadith that I will draw your attention to. I think this will encourage us to commit to nobility and to good deeds. لو أن رجلا يخر على وجهه من يوم ولد إلى يوم يموت في مرضات الله عز وجل لحقره يوم القيامة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. And I would like you to dive into the statement of the Prophet of Allah. The Prophet of Allah says, a child is born. From the time it is born, that child falls into sajda. Why did the Prophet say sajda? Because wasjud waqtarib. The closest you can become to Allah in this dunya is through sajda. So, law anna rajulan yakhirru ala wajhihi mi yawmi wulida ila yawmi yamud. From the time he was born till the time he died, he placed his forehead in sajda. Fi maradati Allahi azza wa jal. To please Allah Rabbul Izzat. Now think about how much good deeds he will gather. He hasn't committed a sin. Because his whole time is in sajda. So he has accumulated such a reward. But on the day of judgment when he is in that theater, He will consider his good deeds to be insignificant. When he looks at his deeds, he will say that this is not good enough. I can't make it across the line. So what is our position? What is our position? So we try to engage in good deeds. I will conclude on a story, and I believe that this story will be lasting. It will stick in your mind for many, many days. There was a king. He had this massive, massive garden. There was a main entry door and a main exit door. And inside that garden, there were many subdivisions. And in those subdivision gardens, there were trees that had many, many fruits. So one day the king called one of his servants and he said, look, I'm giving you this basket. I'm giving you this basket. And I would like you to enter from the main gate and pass through the small, small gardens and exit from the main gate. He said, that's pretty simple. What do I have to do? He said, you have to pluck fruits. You have to pluck fruits. That's what you have to do. Pluck fruits. So he said, all right, that's pretty simple. I will pluck fruits and I will fill the basket and I will give it to you as a gift. The king said, go. He went into the first garden. He entered through the main gate and he made it into the first garden. He looked at the tree. There was a beautiful fruit hanging. He looked at it. And he was ready to pluck it and he said, oh, why should I pluck it right here? There may be a fruit that is better than this in the next garden. And why should I carry this excess weight? I can carry an empty basket. I will pluck from the next garden. Now the condition the king set is that if you exit a garden, you can't return back. So he exited this garden. So he couldn't come back to it. He came to the next garden, there was another tree there, and there was fruit hanging. The same thought came through his mind, why should I take from this garden? There's a possibility the fruit in the next garden is better. And why should I take this excess weight? So he went to the third garden, he couldn't return to the second and the first. 
He kept doing this. Now there were only two gardens left. When he went to the second last garden, the basket was empty. He looked at the fruit and the fruit was rotten. Absolutely rotten. He said, I can't pluck this fruit because it's not good enough to be presented to the king. So now he is on the waiting list. Meaning that it's a chance. I have to make it. I can't return to the previous gardens. I will go to the final garden praying, praying that there is good fruit hanging from the tree. He goes into the last garden and all the trees are nude. They have nothing. He exits from the main gate and there's an empty basket. What is the meaning of this dream? Every day is a garden for you. And every day there are fruits hanging for you. Don't delay it to the next day. Shaitan is very, very intelligent. To a non-believer, he says, this is okay. To haram, he will say, zina is okay. No worries, don't. Enjoy life. They will commit zina. But to a Muslim, he can't say that zina is halal. He never comes to the Muslim and says that this is halal and do it. What he says is, we will make tawbah afterwards. We will make tawbah afterwards. And if once a person has the feeling that I should commit to a good deed, he said, indeed, do the good deed, but do it tomorrow. His way of dealing with the Muslim is very different. He makes us postpone our agenda, our idea. So every day that is passing, we are leaving our basket empty. Now what happens is that when we are very old, then we make dua, Ya Allah, have mercy upon us with the empty basket. So my noble brothers, sisters, my stay here has been beautiful. All the brothers that uh, invited me and contributed in inviting me and sharing a few moments with you, I'm a person like you. You make dua for me, I make dua for you that our basket is full with beautiful fruits that we can present in the court of Allah. So Allah can give us ajr upon that. And as I said yesterday, it is not a matter of sharing knowledge. What we should be thinking of myself and my brothers and sisters, that whatever has been said, if it is correct, Allah give us the tawfiq to implement. If we can bring this into our life, if my brothers walk out and they make some change to their life for the better, then this program, this barnamaj is productive and constructive. Allah Rabbul Izzat accept what has been said. If there was any shortcoming, Allah Rabbul Izzat forgive me. Allah unite us as we are united here in Jannatul Firdaus. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته